By chance, I was standing outside Carnegie Hall one day, and a very good friend, who was a fraternity brother, went to the University of Michigan together. We washed dishes at the Alpha Phi House for food for three or four years. And he had just left the kangaroo show and said, I'm getting involved in a new kids show. I want to do some auditioning. And thinking that I was going to go towards the teenage market, I said, not in the least. So <laughs> little did I know. So a couple months later, we got a call and said, uh, said I called him. So we got a guy here by the name of Jim Henson I'd never heard of. He's got something called the Muppets, which I'd never heard of. He said they're pretty clever. Come on in and take a look and see what's going on. Some, so I went in and they played some tapes and film back from all of this stuff and animation and so forth. And I was totally blown away from the first moment that I started looking. And I thought, to heck with that teenage thing. This is what I want to do because it was obvious from the very, very beginning this was going to be a very unique and incredible show. So I didn't really ever quote-unquote audition. Uh, it was helpful that I knew this guy, but they were looking for a music teacher, which I had been. They were looking for someone as a performer, which I'd been doing for 30 years or so. So uh, we did some test pilot shows, and I survived those. Um, a couple of the other initial cast members didn't, but we ended up with Willie as Mr. Hooper, uh, right along as Susan, Matt Robinson as Gordon, and myself, the four original cast members. And we were off and running, and as of this season, I completed my 45th season this year, and the show has done a major turnaround now, gone from an hour to a half an hour. Uh, HBO has been involved also, and so uh, they let all of the original cast members uh, go, with the exception of Alan Moraloka, who is still on the show, he's probably 20 years younger than the rest of us, and Chris Nolan, who is also young, and they're terrific, wonderful people, and they're really great actors and performers, and they brought in another girl to replace Sonny Manzano, I think, from Puerto Rico. So, that's my life, <laughs> less than a nutshell. <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me dig in on something real quick. You sang in Japan, and you sang in Japanese. I did. How did you learn to do that? Do you speak Japanese? Uh, not really speak. I, I knew was, I, on the first trip, I thought it would be really cool to do at least one song, and I did one or two songs in Japanese and a couple in two or three in English. Uh, my wife's family had long-term, way-back connections to Japan, and so we had a, my wife had a very close friend there. She coached me, and then I got some coaching over there to make sure that everything was perfect. By my second trip to Japan, doing an hour and hour and a half show, I was doing half my show in English and half in Japanese. Uh, that took a lot, a lot, a lot of work. I'd lock myself in the car in our local park so there'd be no distractions. And what I had to do to make it valid, uh, I'd write. It's not that difficult to say it once you can see it, but the grammar is... Uh, unusual. So I wrote the literal word for word for every song over every word, but that didn't make sense. And then I wrote the phrase and the meaning of that whole phrase over that. So I was memorizing the meaning of every word and learning the definition of every word at the same time. It was uh, challenging, but uh, they claimed by my second or third trip I did a complete LP in Japanese of all uh, not terribly old by way of Japan, maybe 40, 50, 60 year old songs, uh, beautiful with big orchestras and everything. And uh, they claimed, and I don't think they were just flattering, they said if they closed their eyes, they could not tell that it wasn't Japanese. And they had a beautiful song. One of them that got me out of a lot of trouble at times was a song called Kojo Notsuki, which is uh, it's a moon over the ruined castle. There was a beautiful story about old samurai in a bombed out or decrepit castle looking up and the geese are flying over and the moon is there and they're reminiscing about the good old days of being samurai and wondering if they'll ever come back. And it's, um, I think I remember, it's like, I'm all froggy, so excuse the voice. Haruko, Yeah. 
Well, I got in trouble in a nightclub <laughs> in northern Japan. There were all business in our business in Hokkaido in the dead of winter. It's a godforsaken place to be, and none of them wanted to be there, but they were sent there. And so I started my club act, and I was dying. They, they all have hostesses at the table, and the place was in an uproar. And I thought, this is going to be a really long and uninteresting night. So I stopped my conductor and said, Come in aside. I opened my show, Babu Makuras, the Soja Rosku, Wakachua Matani Honiku, Kutho, Vitekite, Taihe Roshko Moimas, which is, means I'm glad to be here. So I said, Let's jump to Kojo Notsuki. And I got about two lines out, and the place fell absolutely dead quiet. And from the rest of the time, I had them in the palm of my hand because that's like their Danny Boy, one of their Danny Boy songs in Japan. Anyway, that is fantastic. All right, let's get some questions here. Yeah, call you good name. Come on up to the microphone yeah. so they can record it. I know you sang us a song in Japanese, but is there any way you can sing us a Sesame Street song? A Japanese what? No, no, no. I know you sang us the song in Japanese, yeah. but is there any way you can sing us the Sesame Street song? Oh, Sesame Street. Yes, please. Please. Thank you. Uh, let me think. There are any one in particular? Uh, if you want to sing along in this one. The theme, the theme song, if possible. Which one? The theme, the theme song. Oh. Opening, opening. Sunny day, sweeping the clouds away. You can sing along. On my way, where the air is sweet. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to Sesame Street? And I guess the one I did more than any, which was a great thrill with Jim Henson and Frank Oz, was, Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your name, sing it out. Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? The people that you meet when you're walking down the street. The people that you meet each day. And we had so much fun. Wow. Working with Jim and Frank was an honor I'll never, ever not remember every moment of. They were... Not only brilliant, but of course we pre-recorded the musical track first and then we sang live at the track. And in between there was a little vamp of X number of seconds when I would have to guess who they were or they would have to tell me who they were. And they had a way of turning their little talk around with a pun that I wanted to fall over and die laughing with, but they would never finish it until about a millisecond before I had to sing. Oh, the baker is the one who makes, or whatever the profession might be. So that was interesting. They were great. Any other questions? Yes, come on up. Hey, Red. Red. <laughs> um, I, I know that you have obviously been at cons, and you have got to have seen multi -tours. Hello, once again, please. You've come to cons, obviously, for a while. No, you know, no this is my very first, first one down here. But, have but you, you done other, other I, won, I did one other yeah. com a couple years ago in New Jersey, and yeah. that was it. But this have is, you seen people come up to your table that are multi generational, saying, "What my daughter watched it, and my granddaughter watched it, and what's your most enduring story of multi generational uh, people?" That is almost without a question a given. Wherever we are, the same was with Emilia Delgado, who's with Mara Booth, also with Louise. Uh, it's tremendously rewarding because after 45 years, starting in 1969, we've got quite a number of millions of people that either remember starting when they were three or four years old, or now their children and sometimes grandchildren. We call all of those our sesame seeds, as in multi generational. And the stories are always fun to hear. But they're tremendously rewarding, at least for me, when I hear from kids who grew up in the most impoverished lifestyle you can imagine, in the depths of poverty in Manhattan and, of, and inner cities all over the country, and say to me, uh, I was the first one to ever finish high school in our family, and I went to college. I remember one lady, and I was walking the airport in Newark one day, and I heard this voice say, Yo, Bob! And I looked around, and there was this very attractive African-American lady behind the American Airlines counter, 
So I went over and started rapping and said, she was saying how great it was. I said, so I suppose we changed her whole life. I was being a bit fresh. And she said, yeah. And she told me the story that I just mentioned. They grew up on the worst parts of Newark during all those strikes and all the violent stuff. And she said, I watched the show and I said to myself, whatever it takes, I'm going to finish school and live in a place like this when I grow up. So she got a high school, got a college degree, got a master's degree, and is now a top executive at American Airlines. And you hear a lot of that stuff. It's also very rewarding sometimes to have all different ethnicities. I remember some years ago when they still had a lot of baggage carriers at the airports instead of all the wheels, uh, this very, very portly African-American guy came up, a couple hundred pounds, gave me a squeeze, almost knocked my breath out, and with seriousness and almost a tear in his eyes, said, man, you were my father growing up. And uh, I thought that was cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned a woman saying, hey, Bob, and yeah. that makes me think. Uh, it was yo, Bob. Yo, Bob. <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah, it was a your character is unique on Sesame Street in that you have your same first name. It's yeah. Bob Johnson on the show. Yeah, I didn't even know I had a last name Johnson because we never referred yeah. to it. But I, strangely enough, I have I had an uncle Bob Johnson. But go ahead. So what was what was the reason when you showed up? Did they just say we'll use your name? Uh, not exactly. They had I think four names picked out for my character, whatever that was going to be: the musician, the teacher, the singer, whatever. And one of them, were, out of the four, I don't remember the other but one of them was Bobby. And so I thought, Bobby, Bobby. I said, well, I've been called, I was called Bobby till I was like six. So I said, can we just shorten it to Bob and at least I'll turn around and answer. So they're calling me Albert or George or something. So he said, yeah, that's no problem. So I got very lucky. It came in handy in doing my concerts all over, where they could be Bob of Sesame Street on the marquee and Bob and Grant. And uh, so it was convenient. Absolutely. And I, Alan has his own name. He's connected. And I think Chris is using his own name, but uh, not too many. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Come on up to the mic. Because about that, consider that your name, your real name is the same like a character. That's why people recognize you as Bob. Mm. Also, when the history was growing up, your best friend, Linda Bob, mm -hmm. when she appeared in April 1971, mm -hmm. did they actually have the same idea for her, making her character her same first name like yours? Right. Because since she was deaf in real life, like her character is. Yeah, yeah. Linda Bob, right. She's wonderful. She came to us originally with her husband and the little theater of the deaf. And uh, this is the girl who was, uh, was deaf on the show for many, many years. And uh, so... They, at one point, they were going to, they were considering us getting married, but at that point, I thought it wasn't a good idea because I was touring my own, I, the spinoff for me outside of the show has been I've done uh, all, there are probably thousands of concerts, many of, with over 100 different symphony orchestras for family pops concerts all over the United States and Canada and Hawaii and so forth. And I'd go out oftentimes with three or four of my five children. And I thought it'd be a little weird to get married on Friday afternoon to Linda and show up on Saturday out in Dubuque, Iowa with three of my children <laughs> over the weekend. So I said, I think it's probably would be a little confusing for the children to see me getting married and then next, a week later, have introduced three of my children, not with her. So. It was probably a bad decision on my part because they could have written some really wonderful shows, but we had incredibly great scenes. I had to go to an intense sign language school at NYU, New York University, for about two months uh, to learn sign language because when they knew she was going to be on the show, they said, would you mind learning it so we have someone that she can communicate to? But she was incredible. Yes, absolutely. There's uh, the great uh, scene with you guys in the Christmas uh, oh. uh, where, you know, you tell her to read a magazine. And I just did that stuff always stuck with me because as a child, I didn't know anyone that was deaf. And sign language was so fantastic to see. It was such a, an unusual thing. 
Uh, any other questions here? Now, that, if you haven't seen Christmas Eve on, how many of you have seen Christmas Eve on Sesame Street? Good. Those of you who haven't, look it up. It's probably that and the Goodbye Mr. Hooper store uh, is probably the most memorable for me, and I think almost everyone in the cast of all the things we've ever taped over the last 45 years. But uh, the music is just wonderful. Yeah, we had we were fortunate to have Joe Raposo as our primary conduct, uh, composer, and he could just write songs like at the drop of a hat. As a matter of fact, you know, he did all the great songs of being green and and Danny Epstein was his. I just heard this story a month or so ago. Danny Epstein was his coordinator, and Danny said he got a call from Joe one time, and Joe said, I'm, and I'm not cool. And he said, I've got this thing running through my head, but I can't think of anything else. And he said, the only part I can think of right now is la, 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 la. He said, I can't think of the rest of the song, but of course that became sing, sing a song, sing out loud, sing out strong, sing of good things, not bad. You know, it's sing along. Sing of happy, not sad. Sing, sing a song, make it simple to last your whole life long. Don't worry that it's not good enough. For anyone else to hear, just sing, sing a song. I've never closed a show in <laughs> I've never closed a show in 45 years without doing that, and uh, it it strikes people right in the heart, and they all get weepy and start singing it along and. Uh, it's a phenomenal song, anyway. By I Joe. think the lyric, uh, "Don't worry if it's not good enough," mm -hmm. I think is was so powerful to hear as a child. Yep, absolutely. The other incredibly powerful song, which I thought, well, that's a cool little song for a frog, until one night after a concert out in Washington with the symphony, I was listening to the Tonight Show, and Ray Charles came on and sang, "It's not that easy being green, having to spend each day." But when Kermit sang, you know. It was, it's not that easy being green, having to spend each day the color of the life when I think it might be nicer being red or yellow or gold or something much more colorful like that. And then I thought, oh, that's what this song is all about. And from that time on, <clears throat> when I would sing it in concerts and look out in the audience, you'd see people, all different people, you name it, whatever it is, just nodding their head saying, yeah, that's what, that's what that song is all about. Whether, whatever it might be if they were. However you're different, you feel However you're different, you feel that. It's, it's, nothing has ever been written to quite show the importance of multi-ethnic, multi-everything. Right. It, it really is. That was beautiful. And also, Somebody Come and Play. Oh, I love that. that. Such a wonderful song. That some, I don't know all the lyrics. Somebody Come and Play. Somebody come and play today. Somebody come and sing the song. Make the song, it won't be long. Somebody come and play today. There were just hundreds and hundreds of songs, and Joe was the best. We had other good composers along the way, but nothing ever touched Joe. Before. Joe, yeah. Um, did you work directly with him with a lot of the songs, being that you were a musician? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, I mean, I, I got so many good songs originally, especially in the first number of years. Loretta <clears throat> has a really nice voice. Will Lee, Mr. Hooper, is one of the nicest people and one of the finest actors you'll ever see. He has, without a doubt, Probably the worst voice, tone deaf, of anybody I've ever known in my life. And we always get him and said, Will, when are you going to put out your new CD? Hits from Hooper's store, you know? And, uh, but he was, he was wonderful. I'll have to tell you one, but following up on that, Will was very ill in the hospital. And I went to see him on the last night that he was alive. And I said to the nurse, uh, how's Will doing? She said, well, he's okay, but he's, he's, you can't get him to urinate. I said, oh. So I went in and 
and said, I will. And he was all hooked up with tubes and things. He couldn't really speak because of all this stuff and they had going to keep him alive. And I said, well, I hear you're giving the ladies out there a hard time about taking a leak. <laughs> and he went, <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you what, Will, if, if you'll cooperate and urinate um, and 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 for them, uh, tomorrow we'll dedicate tomorrow's show, and, the, and we'll dedicate the show that's been brought to you courtesy of the letter P for Mr. Hooper. <laughs> and he went, <laughs> he laughed as best he could. And she said that was the first time she had heard him laugh since he was in, and that was his last night alive. So um, I felt good about that. That is, that is a wonderful story. <laughs> Do we have any other questions here? Yep. Come on up to the. Come on up. Uh, uh, she's she's up. She's already up. Okay. You come first. You come second. Okay. Hi, Bob. Hi. I first wanted to say thank you because you made my childhood so magical. And for uh, my fifth birthday, my parents took me here to Miami to see you and Loretta Long in a concert. Oh, yeah, we did. We and, toured. And we met you afterwards, and it was just the most, I still remember it. It was fantastic. We so, had fun doing that. And I wanted to thank you, first You're of all. You were very welcome. We had a great, great time. It was her, great. Uh, her <laughs> husband had passed away at the time, set that whole tour we did from Hawaii all the way across Canada, the United States. We were out for, I don't know, a month or so. It was amazing. <laughs> I wanted, we, we figured we had the first and second half, and so we thought, how are we going to end the first half? And so we thought about it. We made up a little song with the band and said, uh, now it's time to take a break, take a break, take a break. Now it's time to take a break and do what you got to do. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> to the bathroom. Uh, my question is, I was wondering, um, growing up here in the South, when Sesame Street started, you know, there was a lot of conflict about... Yeah. Um, you know, black yeah, kids and white kids, kids they're they playing together. On that four could be divided by two and have two white and two African American. It didn't. The math didn't work for a lot of people in places. Yeah, how how did, did did any of that come back at you all? You know, as the performers or a, you know, the cast that members. That sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, probably never. I'm trying to think back, but uh, it you know it took a while. I, I think it was in. Maybe Jackson, Mississippi, or someplace they weren't going to play the show, and then finally uh, there was enough outcry that they they played it, and of course it became successful like everything else. Thank you. But it was great. All right, Thank yeah. You. Two more questions. We have one here, and then one back there. How did I get one with Jerry Nelson to count? I wasn't working with Jerry. Nelson. Jerry was a genius. He lived in Jersey. And he was one of the original first up Muppeteers when Jim put Jim and Frank and a couple other people together. He he could do any character that one could think of. He was just multi multi talented, great sense of humor, and uh, we missed him terribly when he passed away. But Jerry was brilliant as a puppeteer and a wonderful wonderful human being. He died in 2012. Yeah, it was sad. Yep. We miss him, and his wife is still alive, and we were in contact with her. So he was one of the many great, great people we had. Thank you. And, and Harry Monster as well, right? Harry Monster, and uh, oh, I wish I could. I, he had a whole list of. I think he was Forgetful Jones. Forgetful Jones. I don't know if you remember right. Forgetful Jones. Yeah. Boy, that, yeah. That was a great and, and last question is, is from you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Um, the episode that I most remember about Sesame Street, and you mentioned earlier, is the one where they cast after Willie died. Oh. And I was just wondering how that was. I know. Doing the show? Yes. Doing the show is, we were fortunate uh, that Will died during a hiatus. We were off for a couple of months in between. And so they collected, got together. They had had two years of research before the show ever started. That was why the show started off so well. So they brought all the experts on that we teach them everything they needed to know about death and dying for young children. And they wrote a phenomenal show, as you know. So the day of the show, we had all our parts memorized. Cold, of course, before we went in. But we rehearsed for cameras and just the manipulation for an hour and a half or so. But we made sure that we were doing it as dry and unemotional as we possibly could. 
And we did that for an hour and a half or more. And then John Stone, the director, said, okay, uh, that sounds good. Let's go to tape. So we went to tape live. And we ran the entire scene through without a break, which is sometimes unusual. And whatever emotions or tears or anything you saw. Okay. Or that. Uh, it was all real. There was no acting in there. We could barely keep it together. And as we finished, there was dead silence. And John came out and he said, it was incredibly well done. But he said, there's one I'd like to, we'd like to do one little pickup towards the end. We said, oh, we reluctantly said, okay. So we got set again and picked it up at a certain point. We just got 30 or 40 seconds to a minute into it, and it all started falling apart. We, we couldn't do it again. So he said, never mind. So the, the first take was the take you saw. And every network knew it was going to be such a, an important show for everyone to see that each of us were on one of the other major networks to promote it the day before, which is probably the first and only an unheard of thing for a network to be promoting another uh, PBS show. It was, a, it was a beautiful episode, and this was just a wonderful time. We all got to hear Bob McGrath sing right in front of us. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob McGrath, he'll be signing at his booth. I believe it's number 331, and he'll be back doing a QA and a on Monday with Emilio Delgado, and I'll be moderating that as oh, well. Oh, good, good. Thank you guys Thank very you. much. Thank Bob so McGrath, everyone. Thank you.